Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing the analysis into Nietzsche's uh, Will to Power. I'm going to be discussing and analyzing um, the section between 12b and 15. So between um, notes 12b and 15, we'll cover the span of this uh, lecture, and this is going to be section 3 in the notes. Again, um, when the notes pop up, click the link. It'll take you to the PDF. Download the PDF and use the PDF to follow along. Okay, let's begin. This is Will to Power. And this is uh, section three. And this is notes 12b to 15. Okay, so what I want to do is I, the last video, I ended the last video by reading um, section 12, 12b. What I want to do now is I want to pick up um, by rereading that section again. It's a very, very important section. Um, it's one, for me, one of the, my personal interest, one of the most important sections uh, in all of the notes, right? Of all of this thousand plus notes, this is one of the most, for me, one of the most important um, notes. So I want to read the note again, which is 12b. And then what I'm going to do is begin a very, very systematic analysis of the notes. Okay, um, so let's read it again. And this is uh, note 12b. Final conclusion, and let me just look. I'm reading out of the Kaufman, uh, the Kaufman text. 12b is at the very bottom. I think the page is uh, 14. Okay, so it's at the very bottom of page 13, and it goes from page 13 to page 14. Okay. I'm just going to read it off of the note. Final conclusion. All of the values by means of which we have tried so far to render the world um, esteemable for ourselves, and which then proved inapplicable and therefore devalued the world, all these values are, psychologically considered, the result of certain perspectives of utility, designed to maintain and increase human constructs of domination. I'm going to spend a lot of time fleshing out that particular passage, right? Um, designed to maintain and increase human constructs of domination. And they have been falsely projected into the essence of things. What we find here is still the hyperbolic naivete of man, positing himself as the meaning and measure of the value of things, right? So this is note 12b, and the question becomes, what in the world does all that mean? What application does this have to Nietzsche's concept of nihilism, his concept of pessimism? How do we make sense of his worldview, given that he's describing this final conclusion as um, specifically and intentfully, willfully designed to dominate, right? It's a, uh, a system of domination. Well, what I wanted to do is I created on the top of page 12 um, a diagram. And in this diagram, I'm going to describe how we make sense of um, this hidden morality, right? There's a dual duality in this moral imperative, which I'm going to discuss in a second. And we'll look into the text to see what Nietzsche means by this, right? Um, so before I actually explain this, I want to talk about the hidden duality of moral imperatives. The hidden duality of moral right the hidden morality the hidden duality of moral imperatives I'm going to get a marker that's like really bright okay the first <clears throat> is a surface level right this is um, what Nietzsche describes as value obviously and this is this is surface this is superficial Right? When we're talking about <clears throat> uh, this hidden duality, if you look on um, note 14 in the text, which is on page, which is on page 14, you'll see what he says in, in the following. He says, and I, there's a, a number of things that I want to read. Um, values, note 14, values and their changes are related to increases in the power of those positing the values. I'll read that again. Right? Values and their changes are related to increases in power, increases in power of those 
who posit these values, right? So what we need to do is we need to recognize um, what's at stake here. <clears throat> we know for Nietzsche that value is, um, and the highest value, right, is an imperative that is put into place by the moral system. And we've seen that this imperative, the ought, is what is directing us towards it, right? And I've discussed this at length, right? So the distinction between what is the case and what ought to be the case, that value is what is attracting us, what is allowing us to ascribe to um, conformity, right? So we have the ought is distinction. <clears throat> and we are directed toward that value, right? So when we talk about the moral imperative, the value that we recognize, what we ought to do, is, is surface level, right? There's, there's a deeper implication, according to Nietzsche, for the function that these moral imperatives, that these values have, right? He says specifically, right, the result, and this is back to um, note 12b, the result of certain perspectives of utility designed to maintain, right, all of these values, this is his quote, right, all of these values are psychologically considered the result, so the values are the result of certain perspectives of utility designed, they've been designed to do what? It's been designed to maintain and increase human constructs of domination. So that when we're talking about the moral imperative, we have value at the surface level, what we ought to do, but a little bit more insidious, right? A little bit more dangerous, a little bit more latently is this notion of domination. Right? Domination. And this is the real motivation, the act of control, right? This is the act of control. And obviously we recognize, at least now on a very, very surface level, that there is a sense in which behavior is controlled, human behavior is controlled. If this is the case, and I ascribe to a moral and imperative, an ideological system of belief, wherein I ought to do some action X, then insofar as I believe that I ought to do that action X, that belief is going to control how I act in the world, right? So that my behavior becomes controlled by the ideological system, by the moral imperative, by the prescriptions of um, the moral value system, right? All of this is a system of domination and control. So to read Nietzsche again, and just to direct you to the text itself so that you clearly understand, um, look on the top of page 14 in the, uh, the, the Kaufman text. Um, all of these, right after the dash, right? All of these values, all of the values are psychologically considered the result of certain perspectives of utility designed to maintain and increase human constructs of domination. The reason that these value systems are put into place is to um, maintain and increase domination. Right? So it's a system of control, a system of dominating and controlling the behavior of other people. Right? Very, 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 very powerful stuff. Um, what I want to do is, I want to try and explain this diagram because it's not necessarily apparently easy to understand. We have two individuals in this system. Right? We have the person that I'm calling the handler, right, and the person who is handled. Right? The person who is the handler and the person who is handled. The, the handler is the dominator, the controller. The person who is handled is dominated. This person is controlled. So we have the distinction between two people. A person who is in control, the handler, the person responsible for, for directing the behavior of another human being, right? We're not talking about robots, we're talking about human beings, and the individual who's being controlled by, who's being handled by this other more um, robustly powerful personality or persona, individual. Now, the key thing that I want, to rec I want you to recognize in this whole discourse that I'm going to give is that all of this, the, the image is mine, 
but the justification